Good afternoon. Um, in this session, we are going to have our two keynote addresses. Uh, Al Randall Ray will be our first speaker. He is a professor of economics at the University of Missouri in Kansas City, and he is a senior research associate at the Center for Full Employment and Price Stability. Uh, Professor Ray has written politically on the nature of modern money, and he has been at the forefront of debates within the USA around the forging of socially just solutions to the present economic downturn. Our second speaker will be Bob Jessup. He is a professor of sociology and the founding director of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Lancaster University. Uh, Bob Jessup is famed for his far-reaching contribution to state theory, having authored key books such as The Future of the Capitalist State and State Power. Um, it is a pleasure uh, to introduce both of them to you today because in my humble opinion, they are both brilliant observers of the contemporary dynamics of capitalism. Uh, Professor Ray and Professor Jessup will speak for around 30 minutes each to allow for ample time for discussion. Okay, well, thank you. I've got a bad cold, but I think I can get through it. Um, I'm going to pretty much be a, addressing the U.S. situation in the little examples I give. Um, I was a little surprised to hear this morning that the U.S. ranks up 91st in the rule of law. It sure doesn't seem that way uh, living there. Um, but anyway, that's uh, a little bit of a caveat. What I'm going to be saying, however, would apply to most um, countries with their own currencies. Um, and so I could just as well have substituted Canada everywhere I say the United States, uh, uh, the Bank of Canada instead of the Fed and so on. It, it wouldn't really um, change anything. Anyway, back in um, uh, 1997, I was finishing up my book, uh, Understanding Modern Money. And I sent it to Robert Heilbronner because I really liked his book. Uh, I think it was called Money and the Logic of Capitalism or something like that in 1985. It had a big influence on me. And um, so anyway, I sent the manuscript to him to see if he might write a little blurb for it or maybe even a, a foreword to the book. And he called me immediately. Um, I was a young professor. He didn't know me. Uh, I knew who he was, of course. Um, and as nicely as he could... And in the most soothing voice, and some of you may have known uh, Heil Broner, and you know what I mean, um, he said, uh, your book is about money, the most terrifying topic there is. He says, and this book is going to scare the hell out of every reader. I cannot write a blurb for this book. <laughs> and then he went on to uh, explain what he meant. But here we are a decade and a half uh, later, and I'm still scaring everyone. Um, why? And Heil Broder explained this very well. He said, because nobody wants to know the truth about money. They want comforting fictions, fantasies, bedtime stories. Or, to paraphrase Jack Nicholson, they can't handle the truth. Um, now, to be sure, on the left, the story is about the evil Fed and bankers and Freemason conspiracies against the poor. On the right, it's the evil Fed and Congress and conspiracies against the rich. The one thing they seem to be coalescing around is the need for a return to sound money. And I note that in the United States, both Ron Paul, far right, Dennis Kucinich, as far left as American politics can go, are inching toward a consensus on that, although they don't necessarily agree on what that sound money is. They're sure that, that we have a problem in the United States in the way that we're running our monetary system now. What I want to do today is to argue that both the left and the right, as well as economists and policymakers across the political spectrum, fail to recognize that money is a public monopoly. The shared bedtime story told by all, and of course this shows up in every textbook, is that money is a private invention of some clever Robinson Crusoe who tired of the inconveniences of bartering fish with a short shelf life for desired coconuts hoarded by Friday. 
self-seeking globules of desire continually reduced transactions costs, guided by an invisible hand that selected the commodity with the best characteristics to function as the most efficient medium of exchange, and as everyone from Marxists to Hayekians know, that commodity turned out to be gold. Self-regulating markets maintain a perpetually maximum state of bliss, producing an equilibrium vector of, equilibrium, uh, uh, sorry, of relative prices for all tradables, including the gold money that serves as the veiling numeraire. All was fine and dandy until the evil government interfered, first by reaping seniorage from monopolized coinage, next by printing too much money to chase the too few goods extant, and finally by efficiency killing regulation of private financial institutions. Especially in the US, misguided laws and regulations simultaneously led to far too many financial intermediaries. We used to have 15,000 banks, now we're down to about 5,000 but far too little financial intermediation. Chairman Volcker delivered the first blow to restore efficiency by throwing the entire savings and loan sector into insolvency. And then Congress freed the thrifts to do anything they damn well pleased. The second blow, deregulation, actually dates back to the Nixon years and even before that into the 1960s. But it morphed into a self-regulation movement in the 1990s on the unassailable logic that rational self-interest would restrain financial institutions from doing anything foolish. That was all codified in Basel II that spread Anglo-Saxon, anything goes, financial practices around the globe. The final nail in the coffin would be to tie monetary policy makers' hands to inflation targeting and fiscal policy makers' hands to balance budgets to preserve the value of money. All of this led to the era of what Bernanke called the Great Moderation, with financial stability and rising wealth to create what Bush called the Ownership Society, in which all worthy individuals could share in the bounty of self-regulated capitalism. Now, we know how that story turned out. In all important respects, we managed to recreate the exact same conditions that we had in 1929, and history repeated itself with the exact same results. Take John Kenneth Galbraith's The Great Crash, change the dates and a few of the names, you don't even have to change all the names, and you've got the post-mortem for a current calamity. So what is the alternative? I think all orthodoxy, whether left or right, misunderstands the nature of money. So the question is, what is money? I will, as we go along, um, present my views on what is money. Why is it accept, accepted? What is the relation of the state to its money? What is fiscal policy? What is monetary policy? And my argument is that the orthodoxy, whether left or right, answers every one of these questions incorrectly. And what we have to do is um, turn to the alternative modern money theory. Um, I always show these slides to my um, students and ask them, what is money? Are these things money? They're definitely human-made. They're recording something. What they're recording, we don't know. Okay, the first one is about um, half a million years old. These are 50,000 years old. You can see increasing complication um, in the scratch marks, but we don't really know what these, is, what, what these things are. Which of these are money? Well, we have some stories about uh, the wampum, uh, and uh, there's some speculation about these ancient uh, clay balls that had tokens uh, inside. Um, we actually uh, do know what these tokens represented, and we know that there was a transformation from the tokens themselves to pressing them into clay, and then finally we get the clay shibati tablets, which we can read. And we know that these are all about credits and debits. The earlier ones, we're not sure, because we can't read them. What about these? Maybe some people here finally are starting to recognize something uh, that they might want to identify in some way with money. These are the famous tally sticks, and there's the famous fire when the exchequer was finally allowed to stop using tally sticks and uh, threw them all into the stoves and burned down the houses of parliament. Aha, all the students recognize these. Those are money. Then I asked the students, what backs up money? 20 years ago, most said gold. 
Okay, hardly any students uh, believe that anymore. They know that it's not gold. Uh, we can take out pieces of paper, and I like to do that in class and read what it says on the paper notes. Uh, many of the currencies do say something like this note is legal tender. We get to the UK pound, we have a picture of the queen, and what does she say? She says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds. Okay. So if you present a five pound note to the queen, she will give you a five pound note. What backs up the currency? People call it fiat. They say there's nothing backing up the currency. That's all there is. Behind the veil of that piece of paper, there's nothing there. So the alternative, what is money? It's a state monopoly. It is a social unit of account. It is the state's money of account. It is a representation of social value. And then we have money things. All those things that I had presented earlier to you are money things denominated in the state's money of account. So let me return to um, uh, my version of the story. Money is not a commodity or a thing. Never has been, cannot be. Gold could never have been money. Gold cannot be money. Um, it's an institution, perhaps the most important institution of the capitalist economy. The money of account is social, the unit in which social obligations are denominated. Now, I won't go into uh, prehistory here, but I have done it. Um, I trace the money to the Vergeld tradition. In other words, money came out of the penal system, not out of markets. It had to do with recording the debts owed because of infractions of rule or law. And that explains why the words for monetary debts or liabilities are associated with transgressions against individuals and then later against society itself. To conclude, money predates markets and so does government. As Karl Polanyi argued, markets never sprang from the minds of higglers and hagglers, but rather were created by authorities. The monetary system itself was invented to mobilize resources to serve what government believed to be the public purpose. Of course, it's only in a democracy, and I know that that's an issue here, uh, that the public's purpose and the government's purpose have much chance of alignment. In any case, the point is that we cannot imagine a separation of the economic from the political. And any attempt to separate money from politics is itself political. Adopting a gold standard or a foreign currency standard dollarization or a Friedmanian money growth rule or an inflation target is a political act that serves the interest of some privileged group. There's no natural separation of a government from its money. The gold standard was legislated. It wasn't natural. Just as the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 legislated the separation of treasury and central bank operations. And the Balanced Budget Act of 1987 in the United States legislated the ex ante matching of federal government spending and revenue over a period determined by the heavenly movement of a celestial object. These are legislated, they're not natural. Ditto the myth of the su supposed independence of the mo modern central bank. This has been a huge fad in economics for about 20 years. But it's just a smokescreen to hide the fact that monetary policy is run for the benefit of Wall Street. So money was created to give government command over socially created resources. We can think of money as the currency of taxation, with the money of account determining one's social liability. I have to deliver a dollar's worth of commodities, including labor power, to satisfy the public interest. Often it's the tax that actually monetizes an activity. We don't even get monetary values on the activities until we tax them. That puts a money value on it for the purpose of determining the share to render under Caesar. The sovereign government names what money denominated thing can be delivered in redemption against one's social obligation or duty to pay taxes. It then can issue the money thing in its own payments that it will accept in tax payments. The government money thing is, like all money things, a liability denominated in the state's money of account. And like all money things, it must be redeemed, that is, accepted by its issuer. This is the fundamental um, 
law of debts. They must be accepted back in payment to their issuers. As Hyman Minsky always said, anyone can create money things. The problem lies in getting them accepted. Only the sovereign can impose tax liabilities to ensure its money things will be accepted. That's uh, something fundamental about sovereign power, the ability to tax. But power is always a, con a continuum, and we should not imagine that acceptance of non-money things is necessarily voluntary. We're admonished to be neither a creditor nor a debtor, but all of us are always simultaneously debtors and creditors. And maybe that's what make us, makes us human, or at least chimpanzees, who apparently keep careful mental records of liabilities and refuse to cooperate with those who won't pay off debts. That's called reciprocal altruism. If I help you to beat chimp A senseless, you better repay your debt when chimp B attacks me. The dollar is our state money of account, and high-powered money, HPM or coins, green paper money in the United States, and bank reserves is our state monopolized currency. I usually like to make that a bit broader because in the US we also have treasuries, that is bills and bonds, and uh, treasury bonds really are just reserves that pay higher interest. It's just another, it's like the, your savings account at the central bank. Reserves are the demand deposit account and treasuries are the savings account. So I'll include high-powered money plus treasuries as the government currency monopoly. And these are delivered in payment of federal taxes, which destroys the currency. If government emits more in its payments than it redeems in taxes, currency is accumulated by the non-government sector as financial wealth, including the Chinese. We need not go into all the reasons, rational, irrational, productive, fetishistic, Ted Winslow was here earlier, that was for him, uh, that one would want to hoard currency except to note that a lot of the non-sovereign dollar denominated liabilities are made convertible either on demand or after some contingency to currency. So many economic units need currency because they've agreed to redeem their own IOUs for it. Since government is the only issuer of currency, like any monopoly, government can set the terms on which it is willing to supply it. If you have something to sell that the government would like to have, an hour of labor, a bomb, or a vote, the government offers a price that you can accept or refuse. Your power to refuse, however, is not that great. When you're dying of thirst, the monopoly water supplier has substantial pricing power. The government that imposes a head tax can set the price of whatever it is you will sell to the government to obtain the means of tax payment so you can keep your head on your shoulders. Since government is the only source of the currency required to pay taxes, and at least some people do have to pay taxes, government has pricing power. Of course, it usually doesn't recognize this. Believing that it must pay market-determined prices, whatever that might mean, just as a water monopolist uh, water monopolist cannot let the market determine an equilibrium price for water. All the economists in here know that, right? If you're the monopoly supplier, the market can't uh, determine the price. The money monopolist cannot really let the market determine the conditions on which money is supplied either. Rather, the best way to operate a money monopoly is to set price and let the quantity float, just like the water monopolist does. My favorite example of a government policy that would uh, allow this um, to happen is a universal employer of last resort program, or the job guarantee, in which the federal government offers to pay a basic wage and benefit package, just for ease of math, let's say $10 per hour plus usual benefits, and then hires all who are ready and willing to work for that compensation. The price, that is labor compensation, is fixed, and the quantity, number employed, floats in a counter-cyclical manner. With employer of last resort, we achieve full employment as it's normally defined, with greater stability of wages, and as government spending on the program moves counter-cyclically, we also get greater stability of income, and thus of consumption and production. Now, I said that anyone can create money. I can issue IOUs denominated in the dollar, 
and perhaps I can make my IOUs acceptable by agreeing to redeem them on demand for U.S. government currency. The conventional fear is that I'll issue so much money that it will cause inflation. Hence, orthodox economists advocate a money growth rate rule. But it's far more likely that if I issue too many IOUs, they'll be presented to me for redemption. Soon I run out of currency, and I'm forced to default on my promise, ruining my creditors. That's the nutshell history of most private money creation. If you've heard of Bear, you did, or uh, Lehman's, or Northern Rock, you know what I mean by this. But we've always anointed some institutions with a special relationship, allowing them to act as intermediaries between the government and the non-government. Most importantly, government makes and receives payments through these special intermediaries. Hence, when you receive your Social Security payment, it takes the form of a credit to your bank account. You pay taxes through a debit to that account. So your bank is acting as an intermediary between you, the Social Security recipient or taxpayer, and the government. Banks, in turn, clear accounts with the government and with each other using reserve accounts, what I'm calling currency, at the Fed, which was specifically created in 1913 to ensure, ensure um, clearing at par. To strengthen that promise, we introduced deposit insurance so that for most purposes, bank money functions just like government money. And here's the rub. Bank money is privately created when a bank buys an asset, which could be your mortgage IOU backed by your home, or a firm's IOU backed by commercial real estate, or a local government's IOU backed by prospective tax revenues. But it can also be one of those complex sliced and diced and securitized toxic waste assets that you've been reading about since 2008. A clever and ethically challenged banker, and there probably aren't any other kinds, will buy completely fictitious assets and pay himself huge bonuses for non-existent profits while making uncollectible loans to all of his deadbeat relatives. The bank money he creates while running the bank into the ground is as good as the government money the Treasury creates serving the public interest. And that banker will, be ha will happily pay outrageous prices for assets or lend to his family, friends, and fellow frauds so they can pay outrageous prices, fueling asset price inflation. This generates nice virtuous cycles in the form of bubbles that attract more money until the inevitable uh, bust. Uh, I won't go into output price inflation, except that there is some connection between the two because asset price bubbles can fuel spending on consumption and investment goods, or it can spill over into commodities prices. So on some conditions, there's a link between asset and output <coughs> price inflations that are fueled by the banks that continually lower their lending standards. The amazing thing is that the free marketeers want to free the private financial institutions, but advocate reining in government on the argument that excessive issue of money by government is inflationary. Yet we have effectively given banks the power to issue government money in the form of government-insured deposits, and if we do not constrain what they purchase, they will fuel speculative bubbles. By removing government regulation and supervision, we invite private banks to use the public monetary system to pursue private interests. Again, we know how that story ends, and it isn't pretty. Unfortunately, we now, in the United States, have a government of Goldman, by Goldman, for Goldman, that's trying to resurrect the financial system as it existed in 2006, which was a self-regulated, self-rewarding, bubble-seeking, fraud-loving juggernaut. So to come to a conclusion, the primary purpose of the money monopoly is to mobilize resources for the public purpose. There's no reason why private for-profit institutions can't play a role in that endeavor, but there's also no reason to believe that self-regulated private undertakers will pursue the public purpose. In fact, we can probably go farther and assert that both theory and experience tell us precisely the opposite. The best strategy for a private-seeking firm with market power never coincides with the best policy from the public interest perspective. And in the case of money, it's even worse because private financial institutions compete with one another in a manner that's financially destabilizing by increasing leverage, lowering underwriting standards, increasing risk, 
and driving asset price bubbles. That is what um, competition among financial institutions necessarily generates. So unlike my um, earlier employer of last resort example, private spending and lending will be strongly pro-cyclical, strongly destabilizing. All of that is in addition to the usual arguments about the characteristics of public goods that make it difficult for the private seeker to capture external benefits. For this reason, we need to analyze money and banking from the perspective of regulating a monopoly, and not just any monopoly, but rather the monopoly of the most important institution in our society. And we have to rectify this. We're headed into another global financial crisis and likely into Great Depression 2.0. We've handed the monopoly power over to Wall Street and tied the hands of government. So the uh, Occupy Wall Street protesters um, have got it right, I think. You have to cut off the head of the beast, the blood-sucking vampire squid on Wall Street that's completely subverted uh, democracy. Now, uh, many people have reached the same co conclusion, not always by the um, same analysis. Some people have called it financialization. I think that that uh, gets us a part of the way there. Uh, Jamie Galbraith has a great book called The Predator State. I think that also gets us a good part of the way there. Uh, my uh, dissertation advisor, Minsky, called it money manager capitalism, and I think that he has the most comprehensive analysis. But clearly, what has happened is that the financial sector has become far too big. Financial um, debt has become uh, far too great to service. Here's a picture uh, for the United States. Uh, our um, debt ratio is um, five times GDP. That means for every dollar of income, we have five dollars of debt to service. It cannot be serviced. The financial sector has grown from 10% of value added to 20% of value added. Finance is an intermediate good. It's like putting the tires on the car. You don't need the uh, intermediate good to consume 20% of GDP, 40% of corporate profits. Uh, the fire sector is far too big. So this picture um, demonstrates that. And what we have been doing in the United States since the crisis is just trying to bring it all back, bring back money manager capitalism. It's going to fail, just as it failed in 1929, the last time that we let finance get so far um, um, out of whack relative to the size of the economy. Thanks. Okay, uh, next up is Professor Jessup. Right, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. And what I want to do is something completely compatible with what we've just heard and to address more generally the question of differential accumulation. In Capital as Power, uh, Jonathan and Shimshon point out nicely, at least to my mind, that I'm one of those who don't agree with them that's engaged with their work. And for me, the light bulb moment, apart from the book on the political economy of Israel, which has brilliant insights into the nature of the beast by looking at the periphery and the interrelations between the two in the context of the world market, is the idea of differential accumulation. And the moment that I read it, a little light bulb went off in my head and I thought, I can work with that. And in a sense, what I want to do is to revisit that light bulb moment of differential accumulation and explore some of its implications for how we might develop a critical political economy. But I also want to raise the question, when we focus on differential accumulation, are we identifying the site of the problem, the explanandum, or are we identifying what it is that does the explanation? Is the explanation for the course, the logic of capital accumulation, differential accumulation and power, or do we say there's an awful lot of differential accumulation about how do we explain it? So that, in a sense, is the problem I'm going to set up. And now I'm going to present the outline 
of the presentation are going to give some guidelines for critique. And I think this is very important. I think that there is an awful lot of unfair criticism about, including unfair criticism of the capital as social power perspective. So I think we need to say, lay down some guidelines for not only how we critique other people, but how we would like to be critiqued ourselves. And what, as we say in the fable, what source for the goose is source for the gander. We need to be clear what it means to engage in critique. And then going to look at the idea of capital as a social relation, which I think is something shared between the Marxist perspective out of which I come and the differential accumulation perspective. And then, rather than launch directly into a Marxist account of differential accumulation, I'm going to take a passage point, not an obligatory passage point, I saw you working on actor network theory just now, but a passage point, I think if we pass through Weber, we can see the limits of the Marxian approach, or at least Marx's critique of capital, and some of the strengths of differential accumulation. Then I'm going to describe what Marx said about capital, and I'm going to disagree uh, with Jonathan and Shimshon that Marx doesn't define capital. I'm even going to suggest he doesn't need to define capital. Although if you want to, he was once asked why he didn't define capital in Das Kapital. He said, the whole of Das Kapital and the books I haven't written yet are the definition of capital. Don't ask me to define capital at the beginning. I'll tell you what it is at the end. And I think there's something similar there in differential accumulation. And then I'm going to insist that what Marx developed was a value theory of labor and not a labor theory of value. Tell you what that is and spell out some of its implications for differential accumulation. And I'm going to refer to my Lieblingsstaatstheoretiker, my favorite state theorist, Nikos Poulanzas, on class powers, because I think power is absolutely crucial. But I think we need to think more carefully about what we mean by power. And I'm going to refer more to competition, which I think is the way in and through which differential accumulation occurs, bring in the world market, introduce the contradictio in adiecto, contingent necessity, and relate that directly to differential accumulation, and then draw some conclusions. So even if I don't get there, and you'll no doubt tell me whether I'm running out of time, at least you know what I would have said had there been time to say it. And you can then politely ask me in the question and answer session, could you go back to slide X or Y? And that's what we'll do. So guidelines for critique. We have to present clear criteria for developing a critique, and we have to develop them consistently. We have to focus on the strongest versions of what is to be criticized. Another one of my favorite state theorists, or theorists more generally, Gramsci, drew a distinction between military struggle and ideological struggle. He said in military struggle, you attack the enemy at its weakest point. In ideological and theoretical struggle, you attack the enemy at its strongest point. There's no profit, if you like, in taking out the minnows. You have to take on the big boys and girls. So it's important if you're developing a critique, you go to the core text, the best possible representations of what it is you're criticizing, and not just dismiss those who couldn't argue their way out of a paper bag. You have to present what's to be criticized sympathetically in its own terms before moving to the critique. Otherwise, we don't know whether this is a good critique or a bad critique because we've only got the straw person version of it. And that means you have also to bring out the meta-theoretical assumptions, the ontological, epistemological, methodological principles, as well as the choice of entry point and the standpoints for the analysis of the complex reality. And in addition, look at the substantive specific concepts and claims. And you have to be willing to apply the same criteria to your own work in order to always identify comparative strengths and weaknesses 
And that's the spirit in which I've approached differential accumulation and why my light bulb went off in my head and why I've continued to read the literature on differential accumulation and capital as power with great interest whilst disagreeing with it in some respects. Now I want to address the capital as a social relation. One of my favorite quotations from Capital One, Mr. Peel took with him from England to Swan River, West Australia, means of subsistence and production to the amount of 50,000 pounds. Mr. Peel had the foresight to bring with him besides 3,000 persons of the working class, men, women, and children. Once there, Mr. Peel was left without a servant to make his bed or fetch him water from the river, the reason being they buggered off with his uh, cattle, his tools, his instruments, and so forth, because there was nothing to stop them doing so. Unhappy Mr. Peel, who provided for everything except the export of English modes of production to Swan River. And then Marx goes on, in the colonies, property and money, means of subsistence, machines, and other means of production, does not stamp a man as a capitalist if there be wanting the correlative, the wage worker, who's compelled to sell himself of his own free will. Capital is not a thing, but a social relation between persons established by the instrumentality of things. I once said that to John Law to prove to him that Marx was one of the earliest actor network theorists. But we might also want to say that uh, it's not just a social relation between persons, but also corporate persons. But what you see clearly there is it's hard to define capital as a thing. It has to be defined as a social relation. And as a social relation, it's also a power relation. The key is to discover what kind of power relation this is. Now, I'm going to turn to Weber, who also fails to define capitalism, but has, as a good verstehender uh, soziolog, uh, an interpretive sociologist, an interest in modes of orientation to profit. And this is in the general economic history. It's in economy and society. He says that what is characteristic of capitalism is an orientation to the calculation of opportunities for profit. Mostly, at least in modern capitalism, calculation of opportunities for profit on the market. But you can calculate opportunities for profit, opportunities, if you like, for differential accumulation, in a number of different ways. And he has three subtypes or submodes of capitalism. Rational capitalism, two modes, trade in free markets and capitalist production, capitalist speculation and finance, three modes of political capitalism, predatory political profits, profit on the market from force and domination, profit from unusual deals with political authority, and finally, traditional types of money deals. It's an interesting exercise that I sometimes set my students to speculate on the origins of the global financial crisis in terms of these six modes. An unusual deals with political authority, predatory political profits, capitalist speculation, and finance spring to mind more than the tendency of the rate of profit to fall in mode one, although they're clearly interconnected. Now, what's the significance of this figure? If we turn it back to differential accumulation, differential accumulation involves, at a minimum, all six modes of orientation to profit. Because what's being differentially accumulated is not merely the surplus value generated in mode one, but all of the surplus generated, or all the profits appropriated, net, in and through all six of those modes of orientation to profit. If you wanted, you could treat Weber as one of the early theorists of differential accumulation. But that's only at a minimum, because what Weber doesn't take account of, because he's discussing capitalism, is all the non-capitalist or pre-capitalist modes of what Palandi would call substantive provisioning, which are also generating wealth on which then profits could be seen to be a claim. So differential accumulation, in a sense, is very wide-ranging, very broad-ranging in what it takes into account. 
Now, if we compare that with Marx, Marx is mostly in mode one in terms of free trade and capitalist production. He certainly says things about the other kinds, but he's engaged in an entirely different theoretical exercise than engaging in the study of differential accumulation. He's trying to make sense of, in his own language, the capitalist mode of production as a self-reproducing, self-valorizing mode of production. And that does not exhaust and never could exhaust a capitalist economy, let alone the world market. So there's a major difference between what Marx is setting out to do and what the potential of differential accumulation as an object of analysis might be. Nonetheless, Marx does give us a definition of the capitalist mode of production, not at one point in his text, but over time as the analysis is concretized and complexified. And this is just a quick run through. I'm not going to develop this because that would be a different lecture. Um, wealth appears as an immense accumulation of commodities. So already we know that Marx isn't interested in the forms of wealth in general, but just a particular mode in which wealth is present, the ungeheure Warensammlung of commodities, the immense accumulation of commodities. The commodity form is generalized to labor power, which is a fictitious commodity, but treated as if it were a commodity. There's a duality of labor power as concrete labor and labor time. The capital accumulation can be understood as a political economy of time, with a constant rebasing of abstract time leading to treadmill effects. In that regard, I would disagree that the basic unit of Marxian analysis is abstract labor as if that were some fixed quantum. It is continually being rebased, and that's one of the reasons one can't define abstract labor. It's a reference point rather than the, the, the equivalent of a util in neoclassical economics. The key role of money as a social relation in mediating and modifying profit-oriented, market-mediated accumulation. I just want here to add one sentence that I don't think that money is merely an intermediary or a veil in capital accumulation, but it has its own quite specific effects. I wouldn't go all the way with Randall in terms of it being a product of the state. I think there are two different types of money, each with their own different types of effect, that which is created by the state, and that's the origins of money, and then various forms of private monopoly and their in competition with each other. There's an essential role of competition in the dynamic of capitalism, and finally the market mechanism cannot secure all the conditions of capitalist reproduction, even if we ignore the labor process itself. In other words, there always has to be an extra economic outside to the capital relation. Uh, capitalist power presents that in terms of the, what I would like to call the difference in unity of the economic and the political, that there isn't a separation between the economic and the political. I think that's already there in much of what Marx has to say. And it's absolutely crucial that one doesn't try to combine, confine the analysis of capital to profit-oriented, market-mediated relations. How might I develop that? I want to go back to one of something like 26 different drafts or plans for capital and refer to the six-book approach, a six-book plan for the critique of political economy with three or even more missing books. Uh, some people say wage labor is already part of Das Kapital. Others, like Michael Leibovitz, thinks that he probably would have written another book on wage labor where he approaches the analysis of capital accumulation from the viewpoint of wage labor rather than from the viewpoint of capital. But clearly missing are a book on the state, a book on foreign trade, and a book on world market and crisis. What does that matter? Why does that matter? If one were to look at some of the things Marx did write about in the context of the missing six books, you would have to bring in, in order to provide account of, in these terms, differential accumulation, or in Marx's terms, capital accumulation at the horizon of the world market, an account of the state, including economic and social policy, fiat money, tax, fiscal crisis, 
relative to this morning's presentation, it's worth remembering that Marx said taxes are the existence of the state, economically speaking, and provided an interesting account of the tax state well before subsequent people came on to develop those insights. And of course, he had a great deal to say about what nowadays would be called international relations, but wasn't at Marx's time. International relations is an invention of American political science, but he was very interested in the great mid and small powers and the ways in which they intervened to produce differential accumulation. He had interesting things to say about foreign trade, GU economics, the global division of labor, colonialism, imperialism. And finally, and this was to be the culmination, not the starting point, the world market and crisis, the nature of world money, the way in which the full integration of the world market generalizes and intensifies the contradictions and produces contagion effects and the impossibility of managing crisis. Now, why have I introduced the six-book schema? Because my argument is that if you look at Das Kapital, you get a very one-sided and incomplete account of what Marx would have said about differential accumulation. And if you look at what the missing six, three books or four books would have said, you'll find many of the key themes that are in the idea of capital as power. So I think there's a lot of space that could be open for dialogue, providing we don't try to freeze a Marxist analysis of capital in terms of an analysis of the capital relation within the context of a capitalist mode of production and take the horizon of the world market, which is also, I suggested, the horizon of Weber's six modes of profit orientation. The world market comprises all of those modes of profit orientation and not merely the CMP. The value theory of labor. This is important. There's a small note footnote and one sentence in Capital as Social Power about this alternative reading of what Marx has to say. I'm firmly convinced that Marx did not advance a labor theory of value, which makes sense only if you assume that labor power is a real commodity, because the value of commodities is the value of the costs of the commodities that enter into their production. Labor power is not a real commodity. It's a fictitious commodity. You cannot, therefore, logically have a labor theory of value. And I think Michael Leibovitz's work and Diane Olson's work show that above all. Moish Postone and many others have contributed to that. What he advanced was a value theory of labor. That is to say, he analyzed the effects of capital's treatment of labor power as if it were a commodity. That would have been explored in book three of the six book schema. And if you take a value theory of labor, what are the effects of capital's treatment of labor power as if it were a commodity? You have power relations at the heart of the analysis of the capital relation. All the key tendencies, crisis tendencies of the capitalist mode of production can be derived from that entry point into the analysis of capital. Now, why could Marx see that and others couldn't? Why did the classical political economist miss it? Because he took the viewpoint of the working class, not of capital, and was therefore much more able to see that labor power was not just one Ricardian factor of production among others, not just one thing among others, but living labor with its own creative power being exploited. Linked to that is and these, I think, absolutely critical innovations on the part of Marx. Grossman brings this out above all. Before Marx, there was little analysis of the political economy of time. Afterwards, people understand that there is a political economy of time. And of course, power is also a temporal relation. Capital relation is temporal, not just located in time. And these are some of the key concepts. I'm not going to go into them now, apart from picking up two or three, uh, that are absolutely crucial in order to understand differential accumulation from the viewpoint of a political economy of time. Socially necessary labor time, we've all heard of that. Socially necessary turnover time, which is David Harvey's contribution in limits to capital. And I would add an increasingly important naturally necessary reproduction times of nature. The attempt to speed up the reproduction of nature and to gain a competitive edge 
by being quicker to market in terms of what would normally be considered natural products. All of those sites of time, with all of their different temporal horizons, rhythms, cycles, tendencies, counter-tendencies, and so forth, from Kondratiev long waves through to the rhythms of the labor process inside a particular factory, are an important part of differential accumulation. Now back to Poulanzas. He argues, and I think this is one of his most important contributions, that there are economic, political, and ideological class powers inside the relations of production. It's not economics as the economy, and then politics is the political system, and out there in the ideological state apparatus is the ideology. He says all of these class powers are present inside the labor process. Social classes should be defined in terms of complex class powers exercised in the labor process of the circuit of capital and their articulation with other forms of production. You may or may not believe that social classes are everywhere, that you can read off politics by simply taking account of class relations. I don't think you can. There are many other types of power that affect differential accumulation than class power. And this is one of the fields opened up by differential Accumulation. So what does it mean to say there are many types of class power inside the economy? There's an economic moment, the differential distribution of the economic class powers of juridical ownership and actual possession. A political moment grounded in the relations of authority inside the labor process, different types of management and so forth, independently of whether there's a state or not. And then an ideological moment to do with the manual mental division of labor, its role in subjectivation of lived experience. In other words, power is absolutely crucial even from a rigorous Marxist analysis of the organization of the labor process, let alone beyond. I'm keeping an eye on the time, so I'm just going to let you briefly get the idea that there are different sites of class domination, the economic, the political, the ideological, and each of those represents specific ways in which power gets organized and in which it intervenes. I hope to have shown through my sixth book uh, entry point into differential accumulation. A little more on competition. And I think if you note that I said that for Marx, competition was absolutely crucial to understanding the dynamic behind the capitalist mode of production. I think one could rephrase that. Competition targets and also creates differential accumulation. And notwithstanding all of Marx's wonderful work, differential accumulation cannot be confined to the inside of the capitalist mode of production, can't be confined to profit-oriented, market-mediated circulation and exchange. It involves, even for capitalism, the production uh, not just market exchange, then it also involves production, but above all, how you organize the extra economic conditions of the existence of the CMP, back to the difference in unity of the economic and the political. And it occurs on a stratified and changing terrain. And I've taken these ideas from Marxisms over time, the relative importance of markets, finance, production, commerce, intellectual property, money market manager, capitalism, the relative importance of different forms of competition, liberal, private monopoly, state monopoly, etc., different corporate forms. Competition starts inside firms, and that's also already power, but it goes well beyond. But if you follow through the chains of power rather than commodity chains, it takes you everywhere, almost there. The world market, and then a couple of concluding slides. Just back to Marx, why was Marx going to develop the arguments about the world market last rather than introduce it at the beginning as somebody like Emmanuel Wallerstein or world systems theory does? Because the world market is the culmination, the product of the interaction of all of the different factors that contribute to differential accumulation. It provides the horizon, the ultimate framework within which differential accumulation works itself out. So we have a quote here from Marx, the most developed mode of existence of the integration of abstract labor with the value form is the world market, a place in which production is posited as a totality together with all its moments, but within which at the same time 
all contradictions come into play. With all its moments, I think, cannot be confined to the logic of the capitalist mode of production. We need at least Weber. We need more than that. Differential accumulation is a way into thinking about that. The valorization of capital, founded on the antithetical nature of capitalist production, permits actual free development only up to a certain point, which is constantly broken through by the credit system. Of the latter, the credit system accelerates the material development of the productive forces and the creation of the world market. It also accelerates the violent outbreaks of the, this contradiction, crises. And I think here we're seeing again that money isn't merely a veil, nor merely an intermediary, but through matters like financialization and so forth has its own role to play, and of course who controls money, whether it be a monopoly of the state or a multiple manufacturers or producers, creators of money as a fictitious commodity becomes important. And the world market isn't just organized as a, a flat space, notwithstanding what Tom Friedman once said and now does no longer believes that the world is flat, the world market isn't seamlessly integrated through trade but develops in a very uneven way. If you find temporary zones of relative stability, they're coupled to in zones of instability. They're linked to unequal capacities to displace or defer basic contradictions, crisis tendencies, and conflicts. Unequal capacities to displace or defer basic contradictions, crisis tendencies, and conflict. Does that remind you of the importance of power? Of course it does. A whole series of different capacities relevant there. Associated spatio-temporal fixes have a mutually reinforcing set of structural, institutional, and organizational forms are key aspects of competitiveness and shape spatio-temporal rhythms. But this uneven development continually disrupts established fixes, their associated identities, subjectivities, modes of calculation, spatio-temporal horizons of action, which re-triggers all of those power struggles that led to the establishment of particular institutional and spatio-temporal fixes. Finally, the strange notion that I've been associated with now since 1982, contingent necessity. De facto causal determination, in other words, the necessity of entities, relations, mechanisms, processes, and events, and their ex ante indeterminability. So it's not a contradictio in adiecto. What is necessary is the product of the contingent, if you like, the non necessary interaction among different causal chains to produce a definite outcome that first became necessary through their contingent articulation. Otherwise, you have to invoke God or the logic of capital or some other master causal mechanism. If you don't, then you're into contingency but necessary outcomes. Tendencies are doubly tendential. Any tendency exists to the extent that the entity or process that generates it is itself reproduced. And that's precisely called into question. There's no automatism, no mechanistic reproduction of capital accumulation. Only insofar as struggles to reproduce the conditions of capital accumulation succeed do you get any laws and tendencies associated with capital accumulation. Power is absolutely central to the analysis of differential accumulation. Also, and here I think I disagree slightly with the critique of Marxism in Capital as Social Power, Marx doesn't objectify his tendencies. They are there only to the extent that capital accumulation, the capital relation is reproduced. So again, power is absolutely foundational. So that leads us to the question, is differential accumulation contingently necessary explanans, or is it the explanandum to be investigated in terms of a non-necessary interaction among power relations? And that brings me to my conclusions. As the subtitle of my presentation was Critical Realism, I want to suggest very briefly that differential accumulation is a critical actualist not a critical realist concept. It expresses the contingently necessary resultant of many types of power relations, actualized in specific institutional, organizational, and interpersonal contexts that cover both instituted and unstructured relations of domination. And I think this is the key insight to capital as social power. 
that we have to take a totalizing perspective without positing a totality. And what connects differential accumulation in all of the contingently necessary types of power relation, sorry, of relations that produce it is precisely the notion of power. But the key question then, is that the explanance? Does it explain dominant capital? or the explanandum, how do we explain differential accumulation as a contingently necessary result? And what I want to suggest, because that might be read as a criticism, in part, of course, it is a criticism, uh, but I think that were we to reread Capital as Power and many of the other pieces that preceded and have succeeded that text, we'll find many explicitly stated or implied underlying critical realist mechanisms, tendencies, processes, etc., that enable us to understand the hyper-complexity of power relations. And so for me, the challenge is to systematize the insights of capital as power. That's one more sentence. They have to systematize the insights of capitalism as power with some of the, co the other contributions, including those of a rigorous Marxist critique of political economy, but also other insights from institutional and evolutionary economics. And this is my last statement. Uh, in Capitalist Power, we have the claim that Marx did not define capital. I've suggested you can define capital, but it's by reading and studying the texts and not looking for one citation somewhere. I think we might throw out to capital as power, where do you define power and its mechanisms? You tell us that capital is a mode of power. You don't tell us what other types of power are, what the limits to capitalization or the capitalization of power might be, what the alternatives are. And I think one of the most fruitful areas of inquiry is to revisit what we mean by power its mechanisms and how they work out in a contingently necessary way to produce differential accumulation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, could Professor Ray and Professor Jessup just sit here so uh, they can address the audience? Okay, uh, we're firstly going to just take a round of three questions. Uh, please put your hand up if you want to uh, question uh, either Professor Jessup or Professor Ray or make a comment. Yes, you in the back, please. Just, just a minute, we're just going to get you the mic so you can be recorded. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned as a, uh, a principle of uh, ideological critique that you should take the theory at its strongest. Hmm. Well, I don't recognize Marx's ontology in the way you describe it. In Marx's ontology, the labor capital relation is a relation that embodies self-estrangement. And self-estrangement in Marx is, the, uh, is his understanding taken from Hegel of how a uh, human being develops through labor. And what it, uh, in, in, in both of, uh, in the case of the capital wage labor relation, both the capitalist and the wage labor exist in self estrangement. Um, and there is a, a human development that results from that, which is the ultimate source of uh, crisis. But we, we, we go from a situation of greed, so Weber is not very useful to us, because Weber is always insisting that everything is instrumentally rational. Uh, I don't think that's, Marx occasionally makes statements that suggest that that's what he thinks the capitalist is up to, but that would be falsified by the most recent financial crisis. So I don't think that instrumental rationality is a way of understanding capitalism entirely. And anyway, true wealth is the full development of human capabilities and the actualization in, in life of a truly good life, which requires the development of, of these capabilities and knowledge of what a truly good life would be. It's taken from the Greeks. So I don't recognize Marx in what you say about it. Uh, another uh, two questions, please. Uh, Jeremy and then John Shaw. Hi, um, my question is to Professor Jessup. Um, Going to make somewhat of an imminent critique of your presentation, which is that at the beginning you prefaced the presentation by suggesting the correct method of critique 
which was to tackle the opponent at the strong point and not to create a straw man, etc. Um, but I don't recall differential accumulation as expounded by Nitzan and Bickler being defined or treated in any length in your presentation. And I wonder if that enabled you to incorporate the concept apparently more seamlessly into a Marxian understanding. So I suppose my question is just could you expand a little bit on, on where you see how you understand their concept of differential accumulation and how they understand it in a non-Marxist fashion and then how you manage to integrate that into your own understanding. Thank you, Jeremy. And now, John Chung. Uh, I'm very happy to hear, the, hear the Professor Randall's uh, speaking today because I, f I remember myself very impressed by your work uh, a few years ago. I have uh, one question about the origin of modern banking and modern money. So as you, you, as you know well, you might know well, uh, the, the, the first bankers in the West who, who ma made, uh, for the first time in history, is, uh, the modern, modern money, modern, modern form of paper money is the Goldsmith bankers. Uh, but Goldsmith banker is a private banker. Uh, their money, at the time, well circulate in in the community, in, in the London and the, uh, and the, the England and large. Uh, even though their their paper money was not accepted, of, was not officially not accepted by the English government. So how you explain this? Yeah. Private bankers' money became became the major form of a means of payment at the time, without yeah, support of the government, official support of government. So, who would like to respond first, uh, Professor Jesse? Okay, um, there are of course many Marxes. The Marx whose ontology is based on self estrangement and the self-actualization of a human species where labor power is not treated as if it were a commodity but labor power is living labor, creativity and so forth is a very important Marx but it's not the Marx who was writing the later critiques of political economy and without trying to be superficial I'm reminded of something that Gamble and Walton wrote in one of their earlier Isaac Deutscher Memorial Prize winning books where in the early Marx economic concepts are philosophical and in the late Marx philosophical concepts acquire economic content and what I was trying to get at in recovering my Marx, the late Marx or the, the Marx who's above all a rigorous critic of the capitalist mode of production and its economic categories is how Marx would understand the logic of capital accumulation. One can alongside that put the Marx who was committed to the transcendence or moving beyond capital accumulation or the logic of capital accumulation in order to discover the space and create a space for a non-alienated, non-self-estranged uh, mode of social existence where self-actualization comes back onto the agenda. But if we are to do what I was trying to do here, which is to engage in a debate on questions of capital and how one might understand it, we have to look at the critique of political economy and not some of the, the earlier works, even though one might want to say that he never abandoned those philosophical concerns. As to the comments on Weber, it was no part of my argument, although it is part of Weber's argument, to suggest that one could reduce capitalism to instrumental rationality. The point of introducing Weber was to show the breadth of the ways in which accumulation occurs and suggest, therefore, that an appropriate site of debate between capital as power and differential accumulation and Marx is not to put Marx and differential accumulation on an equal footing as if their theoretical objects were identical. They're not. 
and I was trying on that basis to develop those arguments. As to whether or not I should have said more on differential accumulation, I assumed I was coming to a place where there are 101 strong defenders of capital as social power, and it was not my intention, far from it, to show that differential accumulation could be integrated seamlessly into Marxism as if I was trying to suggest that Marxism simply absorbs, subordinates, and eliminates differential accumulation. On the contrary, the point of my argument was to show there are points of convergence as well as points of divergence, and I ended, if you remember, with a challenge. Our challenge now, our task now, is to do X, Y, and Z, to get a debate going, rather than say, oh, it was an interesting little interlude, you know, people have to pass through differential accumulation to return to Marx. That wasn't my argument at all. My argument is that there is a productive debate that can take place, it hasn't taken place, and it's about time that it took place, and we'll learn from each other. Thank you. Okay. Um, of course, uh, I could go on for a couple hours, <laughs> but I know we're going to want to get some more questions. Let me start from the general claim, which is that from inception, you need an obligation, and it needs to be denominated in some unit of measurement. And so, in shorthand, what we say is taxes drive money. Okay? And of course, that can be a little more broadly defined to say that you need fees, fines, tribute, tithes, taxes, some kind of an obligation that is denominated in a unit of account. Second thing is, just as a general observation, what we see is almost without exception, and as far back as we have any records, that unit of account has been the unit of account adopted by the authorities. So we say the state unit of account, okay? However, we are not trying to claim that um, taxes drive money, that that is necessary. It is merely sufficient. Taxes will drive a money. That's a sufficient condition. Um, it's perfectly conceivable, and people have many stories about this, of private entities creating a unit of account, denominating liabilities in that unit of account, and then exchanging those liabilities and using those in payment. It works pretty well in theory. It's just that in practice, we don't find these. Okay, there are a couple of exceptions to the rule um, where we do find private entities. So there's the, the Banca di Giro, okay? So in Europe, at a particular point in time, we can find a unit of account that seems to have been created by the banks with no state authority and um, obligations written in this unit of account and liabilities that circulated, as you said. That is the exception to the rule. It is a very, very small exception at a particular point in time, whereas um, the, the view that I'm presenting fits almost every case that we ever come across. And so I prefer to work on that one rather than the one unusual specific case in the 15th century. Now, money goes back, as I indicated with those pictures, many thousands of years, okay? All, at least back to the uh, clay tablets and perhaps back to those scratches on a rock. We don't know because we can't read those. Um, at, but all of the cases we know of, the unit of account was a, a social unit of account imposed by the authorities. Now skip forward to 15th century or today. Anyone can write an IOU in the state's unit of account. You and I can write IOUs in Canadian dollars. And we don't need the state to accept those for you and I to accept them. And we could have a, a fairly big payment community in which we all agree to accept each other's IOUs without the state ever giving those any kind of a, a legal um, sanction. Uh, even bank deposits in the United States are not accepted by the Treasury. They are not. Okay? The bank just promises to make the payment for you. When you write a check to the IRS, or whatever you call it here, um, the IRS does not accept that check. Okay? It's that your bank promises to make the payment to the Treasury. And your bank makes the payment using currency. It uses central bank reserves. So even today, 
Bank deposits are not accepted by the government in payment of taxes. However, the bank is acting as an intermediary and promises to make the conversion on demand, so they make the payment for you. So the money things are denominated in the state unit of account, but anybody can issue the, the money things. They might make them convertible on demand into the state's currency. They might not. Okay, so it's not a necessary thing. You don't need taxes behind any particular money things to make them circulate. But the general observation is that the money things are almost always written in the state's unit of account. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take another round of questions. Um, Professor Mitsan, uh, Theo, and Sean, you had your hand up. And that might have to be our last round because uh, our next session is starting in 20 minutes. My comment is for Bob. Uh, you raised uh, many, many uh, issues, uh, and many of them actually are thought-provoking. Uh, I can pick up only on one. And uh, I agree with you that uh, if this is what uh, you indeed meant, that both Marx and Weber were interested essentially in power. Um, I think that as far as Marx is concerned, uh, he wanted actually to develop a science. Uh, and I know these days it's not very fashionable to say so. People argue, no, he did not want to develop a, a political economy as a science, but wanted to develop a critique of political economy, and he had no interest in science. Well, I think the, the written facts uh, dispute that. Marx, uh, in, in um, anti during Engels basically writes, and I'm reading, uh, these two dis great discoveries, the materialist conception of history and the revelation of the secret of capitalist production through surplus value, we owe to Marx. With these discoveries, socialism becomes a science. The next thing was to work out all the details and relations. So as far as Engels is concerned, Marx's project was certainly a scientific project, and Marx himself says that what he has um, an advantage over the classical political economist is that he has an explanation for one thing for which they don't, and he can explain profit and accumulation in a material way, and that material explanation rests on surplus value. And that's why he called his book not Das Labor, although I agree that he was interested in the uh, notion that labor acquires a value, uh, but he was interested really in how labor becomes subservient to the logic of the system, and that's the logic of accumulation. So essentially in the final analysis, he does try to actually come with some sort of a quantitative explanation of this quantitative logic that he starts with commodities. Commodities have a value, and that's the logic, the quantitative logic of the system. And I think that in that endeavor he failed because he was locked into the 18th and 19th century, the materialist mindset uh, of um, Adam Smith and Ricardo. Uh, he didn't live in a world in which 70% of things in the universe are actually uh, you know, dark matter, they're not matter. So these days he wouldn't use the uh, analogy or the metaphor of materialism, he would use some sort of another analogy. But what he was really interested I think, is in capital accumulation. And to anchor that in some notion of labor is to understand power, uh, perhaps in his time, but in our times, the only thing you can get out of it, at best, is a distorted result. At works, you get no result whatsoever because labor is not something that can be homogenized, unified, and so on. So I think this is the main reason why we felt necessary, because we started as Marxist, or amateur Marxist, we felt necessary to look for an alternative because this was not really working. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> thank you both for your presentation. I found them extremely interesting and uh, fruitful for certainly my thinking. Um, I have a question for uh, Professor Ray. Um, in your schema, how does Euro fit into that? Euro is a very peculiar thing, and actually, my question might sound very simple, but is Euro money? Because some people actually argue that Euro is not exactly money in the way we understand it. It's, a, it's something that was created by banks. It doesn't have a, the authority of a state. And if you actually read what Euro says, it doesn't say anything. It just says here's a number and, and that is produced by the European Central Bank. So I wonder, how does in your schema Euro functions and how, in that respect, the second one, uh, kind of 
uh, a related question is, how then do we have this situation that is emerging now where the Eurozone sovereign countries are going to give away their sovereignty to something that is not sovereign, which is the European <laughs> stability mechanism and the, what is effectively federalism without accountability? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, great keynote addresses. My, my question is for Bob Jessup. Uh, you mentioned that you read the uh, political economy of Israel, but my question, I'd, I'd like to hear your comments on a concept that's only developed in Capital's Power 2009. So if you haven't read it closely, then I guess just ignore my question. But what are your, uh, what, do you have any comments on the state of capital that they develop in Capital's Power? So this idea that the logic of capital has subsumed what you understand as a state, as, as a state theorist would understand the state, and as what Palancis would have understand, uh, understood the state, and Miliband, and so on, um, that it has been subsumed by the logic of capital such that there is no independent or separate logic of, of the government or, or state, and so on. So just, do you have any comments on the state of capital thesis? Should we go into reverse order? All right. Um, yeah, you can uh, go to the Levy Institute and, and go way back. You can see that we argued from the very beginning, before it actually was formed, it was designed to fail. So the, the Euro land was designed to fail. And some people interpret that, oh, you're, you mean that the, the Euro will, will fail. No, taxes stand behind the Euro. The Euro is a very strong currency, will remain a strong currency, even as Greece defaults and then the, all the dominoes also default the euro will remain strong. It's a, it is one of these um, exceptions to the one nation, one currency rule that we usually observe. And the best way to think about the formulation, every individual country gave, it, gave up their sovereignty, exactly like you said, by abandoning their own currency and adopting a foreign currency. It's the equivalent of dollarization. It, it, had a little bit more flexibility than a normal dollarization because there always was the expectation in markets that if one country got in trouble, probably the ECB would come in and bail them out. The European Parliament couldn't do it because its total budget is, is only 1% of Euro GDP. It would be like having Washington, the Treasury, has a budget of 1% of GDP. Could it bail out the states? No, it couldn't do it. But the ECB could, and as we've seen, it has done a little bit of bailing out. So it turned out the, the markets were right. There was a little more flexibility des designed into the system than there is into the normal dollarization. But uh, because the, the countries gave up their sovereignty and because there is no central authority, the equivalent of a normal treasury, um, that can deficit spend on the necessary scale to get out of the crisis, you knew that the first big financial crisis would be the end of the Euro project, and it will be. Right. Very briefly, in relation to Jonathan's comments, uh, we don't even need to cite Engels. We could cite Marx himself, who describes Das Kapital as a triumph of Deutsche Wissenschaft, a triumph of German science, as opposed, for example, to English empiricism and so forth. So I agree that he was very concerned to develop a science, and it was a science to understand capital and the role of wage labor, the capital relation in that context. Where I think we will continue to disagree, and I'm going to enjoy further discussion with you, is around the value theory of labor and the labor theory of value. And I agree that an, a labor theory of value leads off in a quantitative rather than a qualitative direction. My argument would be the value theory of labor leads off into a dialectic of quantity and quality. And just as a quick reference here, rather than getting involved in the debate, I was very, very impressed with Moish Postone's analysis of <coughs> capital as a political economy of time in the continual rebasing of abstract labor through innovation, through competition, and not merely in and through reductions in the socially necessary labor time, but also through other forms of innovation, reductions in socially necessary turnover time, and I would add reductions in naturally necessary 
reproduction times. All of those have a qualitative and not merely a quantitative dimension. So I would argue that competition in this area goes on, but there isn't a single fixed reference point. It being continually um, rebased. Uh, a little additional comment, I agree that whenever a theorist is working, they are the victims of the sciences of their time. There's some very interesting work being done, for example, by Amy Wendling just last year, I think 2009, or Anson Rabbing back much earlier on the machine, where Marx's original ideas about labor were taken from Ricardo, and then he was very strongly in influenced by thermodynamics and was able to take the notion of Arbeitskraft from thermodynamics, from machine studies, and apply it as labor power to labor. And the whole series of interesting problems then follow on from his fascination with that energetics metaphor. And had other metaphors been available, particularly relevant to a less material or a dematerialized world, that would also have come in. But I think one could also look at his work on money and credit um, to see the extent to which it didn't depend on a sort of very uh, stoff-like, material-like analysis of the capital relation. To the, as regards the state of capital, I think we shouldn't be hung up on the notion of state if state there means um, state in the juridic or political sense. And yes, I have read Capital as Power. I was one of Routledge's readers recommending that the book uh, be published. So I read it very carefully and I got a long uh, review of it that I sent off to Routledge. I haven't shared with anybody yet, but it was a very positive one, as well as some minor disagreements of the kind that I've been voicing. The point I would make um, is that I do not see differential accumulation as an attempt to provide an explanation for the totality, the ensemble of social relations, nor do I think capitalist power attempts to do so, because capital is described as one of the modes of power. If it's one of the modes of power, there are other modes of power. If there are other modes of power, they will also attempt to pass through the state. In other words, the state, in its juridico-political sense, or in its Poulanzassian sense, as a social relation, will perhaps be dominated by the logic of the capitalization of power, but I guarantee there are other competing state projects and other competing, I call them Feldgesellschaftungsprinzipien, and other societalization projects, which may be theocratic, Islamic republics or racial apartheid states and so forth, which interfere with the pure logic of the capitalization of power. So I would not argue that you can reduce the state to the state of capital, but the state is necessary for us to understand the state of capital, where the state of capital is a continually redefined uh, set of conjunctures of differential accumulation. And that's it. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Ray and Professor Jessup, for uh, two uh, very informative <laughs> and Um, we're running on a very tight schedule uh, today. Unfortunately, we're going to have to begin our next uh, panel in just uh, eight minutes.